This is the second passage in the reading section. Let's read the blurb. It says, the passage is adapted from a speech delivered in 1860 by John Hosek. Speech of John Hosek convicted of violation of the Fugitive Slave Law before Judge Drummond of the United States District Court, Chicago, Illinois. Hosek was tried for aiding an escaped African-American slave in violation of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. So as you're reading this, what you'll notice is that in the very first paragraph, he kind of introduces himself in a very specific way. He says that he's a foreigner, he's from Scotland, and his main point about Scotland is that apparently it's a land that has no slaves. He says, line four, let a slave set foot on that shore and his chains fall off forever. And then in line six, he says, in that far off land, I heard of your free institutions, your prairie lands, blah, blah, blah. And what does he do as a result? Line eight, 20 years ago, I landed in the city. So basically he immigrated to the US. And what he's gonna do from that point on is he's gonna emphasize his contribution to American society. So he says in line 11, he opened his prairie farm. He's one of the men who have made Chicago what it is today. He says, he identifies himself in line 13 as one of the pioneers of Illinois. And he said he's worked very hard. He's even had 11 children and he calls them specifically natives of this, my adopted country. So clearly he's very pro-America. And then in the very end of the last paragraph, he gets to what his main point is. He says, line 18, no living man, sir, has greater interest in its welfare, talking about the U.S., and it is because I am opposed to carrying out wicked and ungodly laws and love the freedom of my country that I stand before you today. So we already know he's accused of violating the fugitive slave laws. So what he's doing here is he's making an appeal. He's saying, hey, I'm very much interested in this country. I love America and everything I do is in somehow in service of that. So in the second paragraph, he's going to continue talking about his background. He makes the claim in line 22. He says, sir, I ought not to be sentenced. And that he's going to repeat that later on. He says he is an abolitionist and he makes no apologies for that. And then he goes back to the story of him coming here. He says in line 25, when I first came to this country, I was a Democrat because there was charm to the name. But line 28, he found that he had to go beyond the name of a party in this country in order to know more in depth of what's going on. And then he makes this interesting claim, which I'm not 100% sure if I understand completely. He says in line 30, I soon found however much the great parties of my adopted country differed upon blah, blah, blah. Line 32, in one thing they agreed in trying which could stoop the lowest to gain the favor of the most cursed system of slavery that ever swayed an iron rod over any nation. So I think what he's doing here is he's criticizing both major parties, which at the time I think was Democrat and Republican. And he's saying, one thing they agreed in trying, I'm guessing, which party could stoop the lowest to gain the favor of the most cursed system of slavery. So basically, he's saying that both the Democrats and the Republicans, I'm pretty sure, have basically tried to profit off of the system and probably have done things to um, serve themselves as opposed to do the right thing. So he goes back to his uh, background again, line 35. He says, as a man who had fled from the crushing aristocracy, uh, aristocracy of my native land how could I support a worse aristocracy in this land obviously he's talking about free versus people who are slaves and then he's talking about his own political history he says I was compelled to give my humble name and influence to a party who proposed at least to embrace in its sympathies from all classes of men eventually what he's going to say is he is an abolitionist um, he said that before, and I'm pretty sure when he says that, he means that that was probably a, a specific political party at the time. Again, my, my knowledge of American history at this time is somewhat limited, but he does say in line 41, in this choice, I found myself in the company of Clark, uh, Clarkson and Wilberforce uh, back home and Washington and Franklin. And these, if you read the footnotes, were abolitionists. So the second paragraph is basically talking about how he went from being uh, initially a Democrat and then he became more politically involved and then eventually became an abolitionist. In the next paragraph in line 51, he's going to repeat what he said before. He says, I ought not to be sentenced. And here he's going to shift his argument and talk more in the abstract. He says, why, line 52, because the fugitive slave law and then jump to line 54, is at variance with both the spirit and letter of the Constitution. So he's making his claim that slavery is wrong and against the idea of the U.S. by going to the Constitution. And then he mentions the Declaration of Independence as well. 
And he even says in line 62, the parties, probably Democrats and Republicans, who bend the Constitution to support slavery are traitors. They're traitors to the liberty of the millions of enslaved and also traitors, again, to the Constitution, because that's where he's making his appeal. And then he kind of reiterates that by saying line 66 to 7, as a foreigner, I go not to the platforms of contending parties, I go to the Constitution. And, and those are lines that I think most people are familiar with. More specifically, he says in line 77, these were the men who had proclaimed to the world that all men were created equal. So that's going to be his main reason for being against slavery and why he goes to the Constitution. They were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Then he asks a question, a sort of a rhetorical question at the end of the passage, line 80. It says, can it be, sir, that these great men, under cover of those hallowed words, intended to make government that should outrage justice and trample upon liberty as no other government under the whole heavens has ever done. So this question is rhetorical because he's basically saying, no, they actually meant what they wrote when they said all men were created equal. And again, that's what his appeal is. So if we're gonna annotate this passage, what I would do is just make notes about what the content of his speech is. So in the very beginning, he's talking about Scotland. And remember the reason he's doing that is because it's a free country. And then starting in like lines eight, He's talking about his immigration to the U.S. And then the rest of the paragraph, he's going to talk about basically his contribution to the U.S. Because that's going to be part of his argument. In other words, he's not saying that he's anti-America. He's actually saying he's very proud to be in this country, to have raised kids here. And he's appealing to, you know, the Constitution, which is the founding document of, of America, of the, the American government, to make his case. So in the next paragraph, he talks pretty much about his political history, like his personal political beliefs. So we'll just say political history. And then really, it seems to me like from lines 33 and on, he's talking about his abandonment of the major parties. We'll just write that real quick, major parties. And eventually he's going to say fully that he identifies as an abolitionist. The next paragraph, keep in mind what he's doing, he's, he's making an appeal to the Constitution. He's saying the fugitive slave law goes against the Constitution. He's saying the parties who go against the Constitution are actually traitors. And in the rest of the paragraph, he's basically just being more specific. You know, what is it in the Constitution that enables him to make these claims? It's this idea that all men, all people are created equal. And then he makes that last appeal in the very last question about the intention of the framers, which interestingly enough has been called into question these days. Question 11, the primary purpose of the passage is to convince the presiding judge that, so keep in mind the statement that he said three times in the passage, let's look at it. The first time he says it is right over here in line 22, where he says, sir, I ought not to be sentenced because he's an abolitionist. Then he says it again in line 49, surely for this I ought not to be sentenced for being an abolitionist. And then he repeats it again in line 51. Again, sir, I ought not to be sentenced. So that's really the purpose of his speech that he's being wrongfully charged. So let's go through the answer choices. Choice A, the fugitive slave law is in contact with various state and local laws. So he does say the fugitive slave law is in conflict with the constitution not state and local laws, so A is going to be out. B, the fugitive slave law does not apply to foreign-born residents such as Hosek. He doesn't say that anywhere. He's actually basically fully embracing the fact that he's made the trip to America, he's immigrated here. Again, he says that in line 16, I have 11 children who are natives of this, my adopted country. So B is going to be out. Choice C, Hosek's contributions to his adopted country outweigh the illegality of his actions. Also, nowhere does he say anything like that. He does talk about the contributions that he makes to the U.S., starting from line like nine, where he says, I opened a prairie farm. I made Chicago what it is today. I've shipped some of the first grain that was exported from the city. He's a pioneer. But he never says that because of that, that he shouldn't be charged. That's actually not his reason. Choice D, 
Hosek's actions in service of the abolitionist cause should not be considered crimes. So this one actually works because remember as the passage progresses, when he gets to the very last paragraph, his claim is that he shouldn't be sentenced. Why? Line 52, because the fugitive slave law under which I'm now torn from my family and business by the uh, supple tools of the slave power is the fugitive slave law is at variance with both the spirit and the letter of the constitution. So he's basically saying that the law is unjust and it goes against the constitution, which is the founding document of the US. So that goes along with choice D. And again, because he's making appeals to sort of a higher idea about all men being created equal, uh, that's why that's the best answer. Question 12, Hosek's descriptions of Scotland in lines one to five suggest, so let's look at that. So starting in line one, look what he says. I'm a foreigner. I was born among the rugged but free hills of Scotland, a land, sir, that was never conquered, where a slave never breathed. Let a slave set a foot on that shore and his chains fall off forever. And he becomes what God made him, a man. So what is his main point? Notice he says free hills. They never got conquered, a slave never breathed, and if a slave goes there, he becomes a free man. So obviously he's emphasizing the fact that in Scotland they have no slavery, they value freedom. And even in the next sentence where it says, in this far off land, I heard of your free institutions, your blah, blah, blah. And that's probably what appealed to him in making his trip over to the US. So let's look at the answer choices. A, he sought greater freedom than his homeland offered. Definitely not because his description of Scotland is that there's not any freedom or there's not any slavery there so that's kind of the opposite if anything the u.s had less freedom than scotland b the values of his homeland shaped his love of freedom so yeah that definitely can work because freedom is held in such high esteem there that's probably influenced why he thinks freedom is important choice c his fear of financial insecurity prompted his emigration. So nothing about Scotland, about it being hard for him to make a living, about him being poor, about it being a poor country. So C is going to be out. Choice D, he lacked faith in Scotland's justice system. So no mention specifically about the justice system. If anything, he's praising Scotland for being free and for not having slavery there. So D is out and B is the best answer. Question 13, Hosek's account of his experiences in Chicago in lines 8 to 15 primarily serve two. So they're asking, what is the purpose of him talking about Chicago? Let's look at it. So starting line 8, it basically says, 20 years ago, I landed in the city. I opened a prairie farm to get bread for my family. I'm one of the men who have made Chicago what it is today. He shipped some of the first grain that was exported from the city. He's one of the pioneers of Illinois who have gone through many of the hardships of the settlement of a new country. So he's basically talking about his story of immigrating to the US and how he's worked hard and how he's basically helped Chicago and Illinois. Why does he do this? If you keep reading, it gives you a clue. Line 18, no living man, sir, has greater interest in its welfare. So he's saying he actually cares a lot about America. And it is because I'm opposed to carrying out wicked and ungodly laws and a love the freedom of my country that I stand here before you today. So, you know, part of the reason that he's emphasizing his contribution to America is, you know, he doesn't want to be in a position where he's saying, oh, you know, America's terrible. You guys support slavery. He's saying, you know, I love this country. I've contributed to it a lot. Uh, and the one thing that I don't like is slavery because he cares about freedom and he cares about the overall interest and welfare of the U.S. So let's look at the answer choices. A. Emphasize the extent of his contribution to the United States. So yes, definitely the fact that he's worked, the fact that he's contributed, the fact that he had kids, that is probably going to be the answer. Choice B, highlight his role in helping boost American exports. So he does talk about exports from Chicago, but that's not really on an international scale. And that's also not really the purpose in mentioning all his experiences in Chicago. So B is going to be out. Choice C, Justify his attempts to undermine destructive government policies. Undermine means to weaken, and to weaken destructive government policies, you could argue that the destructive government policies is, in fact, the institution of slavery. But again, he's not really trying to weaken it. His main argument is that he should not be charged and that he's not committing a crime. So C is a little bit off, definitely not as good a choice as A. Choice D. 
demonstrate that the court is obligated to be lenient towards him. Now he could do that. He could have said, hey, I immigrated here, I contribute to America, and I like America, therefore go easy on me. But that's not what his actual argument is. His actual argument is that freedom goes against the Constitution. So D is also going to be out, and the best choice is A. Question 14, Hosek indicates that upon coming to the U.S., he identified with the Democratic Party because, so let's look back at it, it's a very specific place in the second paragraph. Start at line 25, it says, when I came to this country, like the mass from beyond the sea, I was a Democrat. Why? There was a charm in the name. But sir, I soon found out that I had to go beyond the name of a party in this country in order to know anything of its principles or practice. And then he's going to go on to say that probably both the Democrats and the Republicans have tried to benefit off of the institution of slavery. He identified the Democratic Party because A, it welcomed newcomers from overseas, maybe, but that's not what he said. Choice B, it appealed to him for superficial reasons. So yeah, you have to recognize that when they say superficial reasons, that's them rephrasing what he said, that there was charm in the name but then he had to go beyond the name. So he was really only looking at superficial aspects of the Democratic Party, meaning to say what the actual name means. Because obviously the word you know, Democrat refers to democratic principles of government and fair represent representation and things like that. So B is likely gonna be the answer. Choice C, it reminded him of political parties in Scotland. No mention of that at all. Choice D, it maintained flexible positions on certain issues. So this one we have to kind of look at a little bit more. He does say in line 30, I soon found out however much the great parties of my adopted country differed upon banks, tariffs, and land questions, and one thing they agreed, blah, blah, blah. So he's basically just saying here that the two parties disagree on all these things, but they kind of ag agree in sort of trying to benefit from the institution of slavery. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Either way, it's not saying that they maintain flexible positions. He's basically just saying that the two parties differ on a lot of those little things. So all that means is that choice B is going to be our best answer. Question 15, as used in line 34 to 35, the, sw the phrase swayed an iron rod over serves mainly to characterize what? So they're basically asking what does this phrase describe? So let's go back to the passage. You want to start reading probably at line 29. This is probably the hardest sentence to get in the whole passage, but it pays to look at it. I'm not even sure that I understand it completely. So let's take a look. Line 29, it says, I soon found that however much the great parties of my adopted country differed upon banks, tariffs, and land questions, in one thing they agreed, in trying which, and I think this should be read as in trying which party, could stoop the lowest to gain the favor of the most cursed system of slavery that ever swayed an iron rod over any nation. So I think what he's saying here is that the two political parties differ on these small things, banks, tariffs, land questions, but they both are guilty of stooping the lowest to gain the favor of the most cursed system of slavery. I think what he means by that is he's saying both political parties have tried to benefit off of the system of slavery. And then he's saying the cursed system of slavery that ever swayed an iron rod over any nation. So the swaying of the iron rod is done by slavery. So obviously, if you're sort of swinging an iron rod, it's, it's something not good. And let's keep in mind that it's being done by the system of slavery. So all that, let's go back to the answer choices. So the phrase swayed an iron rod over serves mainly to characterize the strength wielded by a single forceful individual. So not an individual because we're talking about the whole institution of slavery. Choice B, the political influence exerted by a powerful group. So this is possible because it, he is talking about political influence. In other words, that slavery affects how both political parties act. I don't know if group is exactly the best word because we're talking about slavery, but we'll keep it for now. C, the control of weaker nations by a country with more authority. So clearly we're not talking about weaker nations. We're talking about the influence of slavery over the actions of major political parties. Choice D, the discrepancy, that's the difference between political ideals and processes. So this has nothing to do with what was said. Again, the institution of slavery is swaying an iron rod over the country, so it's affecting the U.S. negatively. Nothing to do with political ideals versus processes. 
all that means is that choice B is going to be the best answer, even though I don't really like the word group to describe the institution of slavery. It's also possible that I'm totally misinterpreting that sentence, so if anyone has any greater or better ideas, please feel free to leave a comment. Question 16, it can be reasonably inferred from the passage that Hosack became an abolitionist because... So this question you might be able to answer just by looking at the answer choices without having to look back at the passage. Let's go through it. Choice A, he had been part of the successful abolitionist movement in Scotland. So no mention of him being part of the abolitionist movement while he was in Scotland. What he does talk about is being influenced by abolitionists who were possibly from that area. So let's look back real quick. You really want to start from line 35. Now, we had just read his disillusionment with both political parties, and he says, As a man who had fled from the crushing aristocracy of my native land, how could I support a worse aristocracy in this land, meaning slavery? And then he said, right here, I was compelled to give my humble name and influence to a party who proposed to embrace in its sympathies all classes of men. So this is where he was probably talking about becoming an abolitionist, or if the abolitionists were a political party, joining that political party. And then he says, line 41, in this choice, I found myself in the company of Clarkson and Wilberforce, who the footnote says were British abolitionists in my native land and of Washington and Franklin in this boasted land of the free. So these were obviously Americans. So going back to the answer choices, it's clear that the abolitionists from Britain influenced him once he was in the U.S., not in Scotland. So we'll cross off choice A. B, participation in the Democratic Party made him aware of the injustice of slavery. So it wasn't so much that he participated in the Democratic Party that he became aware of its injustice. You get the feeling from the passage he was always aware of the injustice. What he learned about the Democratic Party was that they weren't so good after all. So let's look at it. He says line 26, I was a Democrat because there was charm in the name, but then he found out he had to go beyond the name. And then he said, you know, the parties have their differences, but as explained in the previous question, what they have in common is that they would stoop to the lowest to gain the favor of the most cursed system of slavery that ever swayed an iron rod. So again, th this is a criticism, I think, of both Democrats and Republicans. In other words, initially he was saying he was a Democrat, but then he realized that the Democrats weren't really against slavery. And so it wasn't so much that participation in the Democratic Party made him aware of the injustice. He just realized that the Democrats were not really against slavery. So we'll cross off choice B. C, anti-slavery activism helped him adjust to his new country. No, because in the first paragraph, it talks about how he worked hard. He did his job. It was almost the opposite. Once he was well adjusted in the U.S. or maybe during that process, then he really got involved in the anti-slavery movement. So it wasn't the fact that it helped him to adjust. It was just something that happened while he was here. Choice D, slavery was another form of unjust social system that he already opposed. So yeah, and that was specifically stated in the line that I pointed out right over here. As a man who had fled line 35 from the crushing aristocracy of my native land, how could I support a worse aristocracy in this land? So choice D is going to be the best answer. Question 17, as used in line 58, profess most nearly means. So as always, let's look at it, come up with our own word. So for this one, it pays really to start in line 50 to remember what's going on. So it says, I ought not to be sentenced because the fugitive slave law is at variance with both the spirit and letter of the Constitution. And then it says, line 55, Sir, I place myself upon the Constitution in the presence of a nation who have the Declaration of Independence read to them every 4th of July and profess to believe it. So who's doing the professing? It's the nation. And here, when he says nation, he means the people. So he's saying the people have the Declaration of Independence read to them every 4th of July, and they profess to believe it. So what does profess mean? It basically means to say. So in other words, they say out loud that they believe it. So he's really talking about consistency. In other words, people who say that they believe the Declaration of Independence, why are they still practicing slavery? All that is to say is that profess here means to say. So we're looking for a word that means something like say. And clearly it's going to be claim. They claim that they believe it, but you know they're not actually practicing it. Choice B, confess. Confess is okay. You can use confess in the sense of saying something. They confess that they believe something. Profess in this case is more of like a neutral word. You know, there's you can profess your love for someone, whereas confess is usually you're confessing to do something that you've done something negative, or you might be confessing a belief. In either case, claim is more closer to 
probably the literal definition of what they want. Instruct. So again, they're not instructing anyone else that they believe it. Choice D, decline. Decline has nothing to do with the word profess in this case, and it doesn't really make sense. So all that means is that choice A is the best one. Question 18, which choice most clearly suggests that in Hosack's view, those who willfully distort the core principles of the US should be considered criminals? We'll have to go through each one, lines 55 to 58. So start over here, this is choice A. Sir, I place myself upon the Constitution in the presence of a nation who have the Declaration of Independence read to them every 4th of July and profess to believe it. Here he's basically saying what we said before, that the people in the US profess to believe the Declaration of Independence. The implication is that they're not being consistent, but you know he's not anywhere close to calling people criminals or saying that they're willfully distorting the principles of the US. So A is not likely going to be the answer. Choice B, 58 to 62. So it says, yes, in the presence of civilized man, I hold up the constitution of my adopted country as clear from the blood of men and from tyranny that would make crowned heads blush. So here, when he mentions the constitution as clear from the blood of men, I, I think he's basically saying that there's nothing in the constitution that justifies slavery. So there's nothing that would justify, I guess, all the innocent blood that has been shed from slavery, as well as general tyranny that's been going on. So this is choice B. But again, nothing here where he's accusing people of criminals who are willfully distorting principles of the U.S. Choice C, 62 to 66, says the parties who bend the Constitution to support of slavery are traitors. Traitors not only to the liberties of millions of enslaved countrymen, but traitors to the Constitution itself, which they have sworn to support. So yeah, this definitely does seem like what we're looking for. He's saying there are people who bend the Constitution to support slavery. He's calling them traitors traitors to the freedom of people but also traitors to the constitution so that is directly saying that they're willfully distorting the core principles of the u.s and traitors is obviously the same as criminals here so c looks like it'll be the best answer let's just check d real quick 68 to 69 i go sir to the constitution of my country the word slave is not to be found so this is just a claim about the constitution nothing about accusing people of being criminals and so the best answer is going to be c Questions 19 and 20 should be done together. So let's read over 19 real quick, see if we can eliminate choices before we look at the evidence. It can be most reasonably inferred from the passage that Hosek regards the authors of the founding documents of the US to be. So if you remember that last four or five lines where he asked that rhetorical question, you can probably get this real quick, but if not, let's just read it over. Choice A, well-meaning men who offered proposals that they feared would be difficult to implement. Well-meaning men definitely, no indication that he thinks that they thought the proposals would be difficult to implement or difficult to carry out. So A, not likely the answer. B, ambitious men who hope to change the world with their far-reaching pronouncements. B doesn't seem likely because of this phrase to change the world. Really, if anything, they were just trying to establish a government in America. We can keep B around, but I don't think it's very likely. Choice C, Virtuous men who intended to reflect the actual practice of important ideals. So this one does seem like it'll work because he does talk about all men being created equal. Again, we'll look back at that part of the passage, but this is just from my memory. Choice D, calculating men who made promises that would benefit them politically. So this is actually a negative description of the founding fathers. Someone who's calculating is doing something ultimately to benefit themselves in the long run. So this is pretty negative about them. So that's not likely gonna be it. Most likely it's gonna be C, but we'll keep an eye out for B as well. So question 20, which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? And remember the question is, how does he regard the founding fathers? So let's look at choice A, 66 to 68. 66, it says, a foreigner upon your soil, I go not to the platforms of contending parties to find the truth. So what is he saying here? This is part of the discussion about him not really trusting the political parties and him making his appeal to the constitution, not to the political parties. Either way, nothing in that sentence about what he thinks of the founding fathers. So A is gonna be out. Choice B, 69 to 75. I read, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. Yes, sir, establish justice to promote the general welfare and to secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our pos posterity. So ordain and establish this constitution of the United States of America. So here he's quoting the constitution, but there's really no comment about what he thinks about the people who wrote it. So not likely to be the answer. Line 75 to 80, let's see what it says. 
Start right over here. These were the men who had proclaimed to the world that all men were created equal, that they were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and contended even unto death for seven long years. This seems like it's a possibility because he is saying that these are the claims that they made, and then he's saying that they contended even unto death for seven long years. So I'm gonna cross off B because C seems more likely. And then let's look at choice D, lines 80 to 84. It says, can it be, sir, that these great men, under cover of those hallowed words, intended to make a government that should outrage justice and trample upon liberty as no government under the whole heavens has ever done? I'm going to argue that D is a little bit better than C, because here he is calling these people great men. This is a rhetorical question. He's saying, you know, is it possible that these guys really just intended to make a government where justice and liberty is not being taken or not being carried out and so his answer ultimately is no so he's basically saying he really believes that when in you know these documents it says that all men are created equal that they actually meant that when they wrote it so if we look back at the answers we'll say that d is better than c and d goes along with choice C in 19. So they were virtuous men who intended to reflect the actual practice of important ideals. Looking at choice B, ambitious men who hope to change the world with their far-reaching pronouncements. Possible, again, I think it's more limited to America, and he doesn't really say that they hope to change the world. Um, he's more focusing the argument on whether they intended what they wrote, which is kind of a different issue. So all that means is that 19C is the best answer and 20D is the best answer.